Hi, it's John, and today we're going to take a look at the new firmware features in version 2.3 for the Panasonic G9 Mark II that was released in January 2025. The update adds a few new features to the G9 Mark II, most of which we've already seen in some other Panasonic cameras. Here are Panasonic's release notes for the latest firmware. The one I was initially most interested in is the update to the subject detection options, but the enhanced video features and better integration with the Lumix Lab were surprisingly compelling. I'll go over the main features and demonstrate their functionality. So my G9 Mark II body was running firmware 2.2. The subject detection options do not have the planes and trains choices that come in version 2.3. And the options for cars and motorcycles in 2.2 don't have the ability to choose from either the whole vehicle or the front of the vehicle. So I went to Panasonic's website and downloaded firmware version 2.3 bin file for the G9 Mark II. I copied the bin file to the root of my SD card and reinserted it into the camera. The update on my camera took about 60 seconds. So fire up the camera and enter the subject detection screen. I have this assigned to the AF on button since I don't use back button focus. So now we have the additional types of subjects along with the enhanced choice of the whole subject or just the target area. Here are a few samples of me switching between vehicle types and then toggling between the whole vehicle and the front end. This seems to work well on some of the sample pictures I presented it with. You've probably already seen this functionality working nicely on Panasonic's other cameras, but it's great to see it working well on the G9 Mark II. Though a smart car did seem to get the better of it. Next up, let's take a look at the new crop zoom capabilities. I'll concentrate on video as I think this is the most useful functionality, but crop zoom can also be used for stills. So for most video formats, crop zoom will punch in from the full width of the sensor to the central region. While reading and processing footage from the full sensor width will give a cleaner image, cropping into the central region will return a sharp image with little loss of image quality. On my camera, I've customized the up button on the D-pad to initiate the crop zoom. You can zoom in and out in a few ways, but I'll concentrate on the D-pad. The up and down D-pad buttons will zoom only when you hold the buttons, while the right and left buttons will rack the zoom the whole range with a single touch. You can change the speed of zooming in the setup screen. Here's a demo of the slower zoom. In 1080p, the super low takes about 20 seconds or so, compared with high of around eight and three quarters. This only impacts the up and down D-pad buttons. It does not change zoom speed when using the left and right buttons to rack the zoom. With my Pani Leica 12-60 lens, I have the ability to change the effective field of view from 12mm to 81mm in 4K, with minimal degradation in quality. This equates to a 24-162mm to full frame equivalent field of view, and in 1080p, your effective field of view is 326mm full frame equivalent. It's not something I'll use very often, but that could be useful in a pinch. The firmware also brings a smaller file size when shooting stills, which Panasonic has named XS. Depending on your chosen aspect ratio, this gives you a few new resolution choices. This could be helpful for YouTube thumbnails if you choose 16x9, for instance. I've put the available picture sizes on the screen now. OK, next up, let's look at the frame marker display. These are helpful when you want to shoot a single take for multiple platforms that have different aspect ratios, say for YouTube in 16x9, and also vertical video for TikTok in 9x16. You can use the frame markers to make sure the subject is within the bounds of both video aspect ratios, so you can cut different views of the video in the edit, knowing your subject is going to be nicely framed in each format. Let's put the camera into video mode and go into the menu. Select frame markers and then set. Here you get to choose up to three different markers that can be used all at the same time if that's your thing. And you can change the color of each frame marker independently if it's difficult to see the frame against the background. You can also change the size and position of the frames, drag the center of the frame to move the frame around, and use the corner of the frame to change the size. Hitting the disk button will recenter the frame, and hitting it again will resize the frame back to its default. To switch from one frame to the next, simply hit Q. The G9 Mark II supports open gate video recording of the whole sensor, which gives you more flexibility choosing different aspect ratios in post. The new frame marker functionality is especially powerful for this type of shooting. 
Next up, Panasonic has also included a codec that is new to the G92, named MP4 Lite. This is a 3.8K resolution, limited to 50 megabits per second. The codec is optimized for use with social media platforms without having to significantly downconvert the format in post, which takes time and reduces quality. The expectation is you'll be editing the file on a mobile device, so the small file size makes transferring the footage from the camera to the phone much quicker, while supporting simple edits on the phone. The format is 420 10-bit 3840x2880 with an aspect ratio of 4x3. The frame rate is fixed at either 30 frames per second or 25, depending on your region. MP4 Lite seems to be using the full size of the sensor, as there is no crop compared with 5.8K. And the last area of interest to me is the enhanced functionality that allows you to control the camera with version 1.3 of the Lumix Lab app. After pairing the camera with the app, selecting Camera Control connects the phone to the camera via Wi-Fi. You can make simple changes to focus point, exposure parameters, apply LUTs, or start a video recording. I did find the app a bit laggy, but the potential for remote shooting is very useful in some scenarios. Also, I tested the connection from across the 20-foot room, and the camera was still responsive to inputs on the app. The Lumix Lab also allows you to select images on the camera and transfer these to your phone's camera roll. This works well, though I'm always underwhelmed why these types of Wi-Fi connections are just so slow. So while I came for the improvements to Subject Detect in Firmware 2.3, I stayed for the enhancements to Video Workflow. To wrap it up, here's a simple piece of footage that I shot of my son in MP4 Lite. I used the frame markers with 16x9 and 9x16, and utilised crop zoom for good measure, and captured the footage internally to the camera. At the same time, I recorded the settings from my camera onto an Axoon external recorder, which saves the footage on my iPhone camera roll, so you can see what's going on. I used the Lumix Lab to transfer my G9 3.8K footage to my iPhone, which together with the Axoon footage synced from my iPhone camera roll to my Mac. I simply pulled up the two clips into FCP and did some quick edits to demonstrate how the new functionality in firmware 2.3 can be used to efficiently capture and edit the footage for quick publication to several social media venues. Altogether, this is a nice update to the camera, and Panasonic deserves credit for improving their cameras over time and keeping them competitive. I did check to see if Panasonic had tweaked the way it handles the buffer as it gets full when shooting a burst at a high frame rate, though I didn't notice a change, which is a bit of a shame. Maybe next time. Thanks for checking out the video, and if it's been helpful, please like the video, subscribe, and leave a comment below.